In order to decide whether President Trump is doing the right thing in Syria, you have to understand the nature of the conflict in that region. The fighting in Syria began on Tuesday, March 15th, 2011, after taking Monday off to rest from the previous 2,026 years of fighting before that. Forces rose up opposed to Bashar al-Assad, demanding that the murderous dictator be replaced by a different murderous dictator because it was unfair of al-Assad to not let other psychopaths have their proper turn. At this point, then-President Barack Obama made a speech that used the first-person pronoun I 273 times, with the rest of the speech being rounded out by only seven other words. In response, the Islamist terrorist group ISIS took over most of the Middle East, whereupon Obama punished the group by repeatedly calling them ISIL, which he thought would really get on their nerves. He then declared there would be a red line in Syria, and if anyone crossed that red line by using poison gas, he would call them ISIL, ISIL as well. This stern threat briefly ended the fighting among those who had been killed by poison gas. Now, ISIS is composed of the Sunni wing of the Islamic religion, which believes in slaughtering everyone in sight, as opposed to the Shiite wing, which believes in slaughtering everyone within striking distance. The Salafi wing, which believes in, <laughs> in sla <laughs> slaughtering everyone it can find. And of course, the Sushi wing, which believes in eating uncooked fish and is therefore regarded as particularly ill-bred. As the Sunnis battled the Shiites, the Kurds teamed with the Americans to hold off the Russians, who had allied with the Iranians to fight the Iraqis in the hopes that Turkey would attack the Syrians, who entered Aleppo, along with Harpo and Chico, to call on everyone to unite in killing the Jews. So it's clear to see that Trump's policy endangers the region and betrays our allies, whoever they are. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship shaped, dipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, it's mailbag day, and it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I just that's what I meant. And uh, it's also go listen to Another Kingdom. I am serious. You will love it. Uh, listen to the first episode and you want to hear the rest and the rest. It, I, I promise you it gets better and better and better. Another Kingdom anywhere podcasts are available and a happy Yom Kippur to everyone. The day when Jews uh, consider their sins. I have a list of them if you'd like uh, that I'll be happy to hand out to you. No, I'm joking. Have a wonderful Yom Kippur, uh, the, the greatest, uh, the central holiday of the Jewish religion. One of the most delightful things about our friends on the left is that most of the time they're talking nonsense so that even though their shenanigans endanger the American experiment, at least we can laugh at them while they attempt to tear our country to pieces. They say things like gender is is a social construct. So there's no essential difference between men and women. And so if a man feels like a woman, he is a woman. But if there's no essential difference between men and women, how would a man even know he feels like a woman? What would the difference be? They say there's no such thing as absolute good and evil, and therefore all cultures are deserving of respect and it's evil to denounce other cultures. But if there's no such thing as good and evil, how can it be evil to do anything, including denounce other cultures? Yes, all this is dangerous because they teach it in our schools to innocent children, and they try to get you fired and banned for fighting back against it, but it's also hilarious because they're blithering idiots spouting gibberish, and like the song says, that's entertainment. But what's not so funny is when these clowns actually do make sense. That is, when we see what they really, really want. The other day, I played a video of Chuck Todd attacking Trump for asking Ukraine to investigate candidate Joe Biden, but then rushing to the defense of Barack Obama's CIA and FBI investigation of candidate Donald Trump. Do you not trust the FBI? You don't trust the CIA? No, I, I'm just no, very confused. That's our press defending the CIA and FBI. The CIA and FBI, which are riddled with leftists, they are openly working to unseat a president with the aid of a press corps who runs with anti-Trump stories from anonymous intelligence sources and only corrects the disinformation when they're forced to by honest outlets. This is what they mean to do. Here's New York Times reporter James Stewart telling us that this is the way it's meant to be. It's interesting that you really tackle this issue because deep state is one of these phrases that really wasn't in our political lexicon until a few years ago with President Trump. And his central allegation is that there's people inside these government agencies actively working against him. What did you find? Well, you, you meet these characters in my book. And the fact is, in a sense, he's right. There is a deep state. There is a bureaucracy in our country who has pledged to 
respect the Constitution, respect the rule of law. They do not work for the president. They work for the American people. And as Comey told me in my book, thank goodness for that, because they are protecting the Constitution and the people when individuals, we don't have a monarch, we don't have a dictator, they restrain them from crossing the boundaries of law. Well, the deep state is now a pejorative term. When, you, when someone is called deep state, they don't mean that as a compliment. Well, it's pejorative because of how it was treated in Turkey and Egypt with a deep state of people who were protecting their own power. The, what Trump calls the deep state in the United States is protecting the American people and protecting the Constitution. It's a positive thing. So it's a positive thing when unelected, unidentified agents of a permanent government conspire in secret and in shadows to undermine the working of our duly elected president. And what's more, if you oppose that, you're the problem. Here's CNN talking head, New York Times contributor and sometimes consultant to the State Department, Wajahat Ali, telling us that the FBI now considers it a form of domestic terrorism to put forward the idea that the deep state is doing what it's doing, conspir conspiring against our president. The FBI, according to a Yahoo document that they uncovered, is saying that QAnon and conspiracy theories like the one mentioned by Senator Johnson about this deep state, about law enforcement against Trump, is now a domestic terror threat. They're saying leading up to 2020, they fear that these conspiracy theories will mobilize individuals and groups to violence like the Pizzagate conspiracy theory of 2016. Remember that? When that guy showed up with a gun here in D.C. because he thought that Hillary Clinton and Democrats had a child sex ring in a D.C. pizzeria? That's what we're dealing with. And QAnon now is that Trump rallies and deep state conspiracy theories are spotted by Republican senators. It's serious business. So get this straight. It's a good thing that the deep state is conspiring against the elected government. So if you say the deep state is conspiring against the elected government, the deep state is going to treat you like a terrorist because it's such a good thing. We don't want you to expose it. Weirdly, that actually does make sense. It makes sense if what you want is an unelected tyranny antithetical to everyone, everything this country stands for. Deep state anti-election conspirators and their fellow travelers at the New York Times and NBC News and in Chuck Todd's imagination are now open enemies of the founding, enemies of the people, you might say. When they don't make sense, they're comical. When they do make sense, they're downright dangerous. All right, we're going to talk more about this and certainly more about this crazy impeachment stuff going on. But first, let us talk about ZipRecruiter. When you see the way this show is run, you must say to yourself, why didn't they use ZipRecruiter to hire the people so they didn't have that guy pressing the screen button every 10 minutes? If only, if only we had gone to ZipRecruiter. If you take a tip from Cafe Altura's COO, Dylan Miskowitz, who needed to hire a director of coffee for his organic coffee company, but he was having trouble finding qualified applicants, he switched to Zip Recruiter, and that's how Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days, because Zip Recruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job so you get qualified candidates first. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. All one word, ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. All right, let us uh, see, you know, this um, Trump is now fighting back against this kind of lawless impeachment thing. I mean, it's not against the law because the directions for impeachment are so vague in the Constitution, but they haven't taken any vote. They're not letting anybody on the other side speak. They're not releasing anything to the public. And the White House now says it won't cooperate. Just, I just want you to remember, think back to when uh, Bill Barr, the attorney general, released the Mueller report. And there were certain, first he released a little bit of it saying, look, I've got to, I will release the rest in a minute, but I have to go through it to make sure there's nothing that is not allowed to be released. Then he released that. Then he had to black out certain small parts that by law he had to black out because they were grand jury testimony and it was supposed to be kept secret. And all we heard from Adam Schiff is, oh, the, oh my goodness, Bill Barr, what a dishonest guy this Bill Barr is not showing us everything. And now 
now when they have they're getting testimony from people in this in the intelligence committee they're releasing it only in dribs and drabs and only those parts that make trump feel guilty so the white house says it won't cooperate with the uh with the probe anymore um the intelligence committee subpoenaed ambassador uh, to the eu gordon sunland and he didn't show up because the White House said, no, you can't testify. The White House counsel, Pat Chipalone, I believe it's pronounced, you have des- wrote a letter saying, you have designed and implemented your inquiry in a manner that violates fundamental fairness and constitutionally mandated due process. President Trump cannot permit his administration to participate in this partisan inquiry under these circumstances. A senior administration official said it was ordering a full halt on cooperating with the impeachment probe. In other words, put up or shut up, have a vote, Make sure that uh, the uh, that you actually want to have this impeachment. That's what they did the other three times. There was an impeachment hearing. Uh, let's see, it was Johnson, Nixon, and Clinton. They had a vote. They pushed forward with it. That meant there was subpoena power on both sides. They could have witnesses on both sides. I, you know, by the way, I don't think that Trump, you know, Schiff is now talking about bringing in the whistleblower on this Ukraine call and masking his voice and making sure nobody sees his face to protect him. It's not that Trump, under these circumstances, has a right to face his accusers. We have a right. We have a right to face Trump's accusers because we elected Trump and these guys are not going to take him out. They're not going to remove him without us seeing who this guy is, because there's all kinds of talk that the whistleblower had connections to the Democrat Party. It is ridiculous. So anyway, Matt Gates came out. He's the Republican on the Intelligence Committee, and he came out and he just lambasted uh, this entire process. What we see in this impeachment is a kangaroo court. And Chairman Schiff is acting like a malicious Captain Kangaroo. He lied about the Russia investigation, that he had more than circumstantial evidence. He lied about meeting with the whistleblower prior to the whistleblower's uh, ultimate uh, test- or, uh, writing of, of their complaint. And we would like to unpack the last set of Schiff lies regarding the Volcker testimony before we go to the next set of Schiff lies on yeah. Sunland or any further, yeah. or any further witnesses. So... So Adam Schiff, you know, I keep calling him McCarthy because that's what he is. He keeps saying he has evidence, but he can't tell you the evidence. He, it's all obvious. That's right there in front of us that uh, Trump colluded with the Russians. Now Trump is uh, pr- pressuring the Ukraine. I just want to take you back because, you know, Jake Tapper did this thing the other day that really, really bothered me. He came out and he said to the Republicans, just remember those Republicans who didn't stand up against jo- Joseph McCarthy back in the 50s, they are remembered poorly by history. So you better stand up now. Meanwhile, he it was on Jake Tapper's show that Adam Schiff did his Joe McCarthy routine saying he had evidence that he didn't have. I'm just going to play, I want to play a little bit of that piece from the old, this is during, this he's talking about Russian collusion now. And he said he had more than circumstantial evidence. He couldn't show you what it was, but it was all right there in front of you. And he gave this list of all the things he was putting together for Russian collusion that we now know simply did not exist. This is an old cut of Adam Schiff up to his McCarthyite tricks. You know, I think you have to look at the pattern and the chronology. You have in late April the Russians approaching the Trump campaign and saying, we have stolen Hillary Clinton emails. You have only weeks later the Russians making another approach to the campaign, this time at the highest levels, offering dirt on Hillary Clinton. Sure. Uh, the campaign already on notice that they have emails. Uh, you then have the message going back from the campaign to the Russians, basically, we would love to have your help, we'd love to play ball. But we are really disappointed in what you gave us. And only days later, Julian Assange announces he's received stolen emails, which we know now came from the Russians. And the Russians themselves start publishing the emails through these cutouts. You then have Trump Jr. in private secret communication with WikiLeaks. So, so I just want to remind Jake Tapper that history did not look fondly on CNN reporters who let McCarthy do his McCarthyite thing, which is what Schiff is doing there. We now know. We know he is. This is not like some conspiracy thing. He was listing all these things as if they were proof of collusion that we now know through the Mueller report simply didn't happen. Okay, so now here's yesterday Schiff again doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing, piling up the evidence that Trump did something wrong in the Ukraine. And Trump did have a big mouth when he said, oh, yeah, you should investigate Biden. But come on, there's been no quid pro quo. This this is the other thing that the witness they had, uh, Volcker, 
who was the special envoy, the former special envoy to the Ukraine. They kept releasing these little dribs and drabs of emails he sent and text messages he sent, making it seem like he was accusing Trump of a quid pro quo. But the full testimony that they didn't release, which simply leaked, showed Volcker saying, no, there was no quid pro quo. So here is after the ambassador to the EU canceled his testimony before the committee. Here is Adam Schiff coming out and doing exactly what he did on Tapper's show. It's all so obvious that Trump is guilty. We know that the ambassador has relevant uh, evidence on whether the meeting with the president that the Ukrainians desperately sought uh, with President Trump was being conditioned uh, on these investigations that the president believed would help his reelection campaign. It is hard to overstate the significance of not just Ambassador Sondland's testimony and the documents, but the testimony of others as well. The failure to produce this witness, the failure to produce these documents, um, we consider yet additional strong evidence of obstruction of the constitutional functions of Congress, a co-equal branch of government. So in other words, Trump refusing to be railroaded is obstruction of justice. It's the exact same playbook we saw before on Russian collusion. Accuse him of something that In fact, the Democrats did because the Democrats did conspire with Ukraine to investigate Donald Trump. They did do that. We know it. Uh, Glenn Beck on The Blaze was playing an audio showing that Democrats did that. So first, just like just like Hillary colluded with the Russians to get dirt, disinformation on Trump and use that to bug his phones, the government then used that report to bug his phones. So they once again, they're accusing Trump of something they did. And when Trump hits the roof and says, knock it off, that's obstruction of justice. It's the exact same playbook. It's also the play, the same playbook they used against Brett Kavanaugh. Now they keep saying they front page stories. There's another whistleblower, another whistleblower who is listening to the same call that we already saw the transcript of. We don't need another whistleblower. We have the transcript. We can see what happened. It's it's just amazing. And I'll show you a story in a, just a second that the mainstream media isn't covering at all, which is really, really interesting because it's going to break and then they're going to be stuck flat footed. And it's really going to be interesting to watch Chuck Todd lie his way out of that. But first, let us talk about NetSuite. As I keep telling you, I am not just a beautiful specimen of a human being. I am also a business. I produce things. I sell my services to people. I license my services to people and I license my properties to people. And that's how I make a living. But you can't keep your business growing if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know what's going on. And it's no good having all your numbers in different places. That's why you need NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. It gives you the visibility and control that you need to grow. With NetSuite, you save time, money and unneeded headaches by managing sales, finance and accounting, orders and HR instantly right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. Right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash Clavin. That's netsuite.com slash Clavin to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. netsuite.com slash Clavin. If you are going to run a business, you need to know how to spell Clavin. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. So yesterday there was information that came out that Robert Mueller had actually either lied to or made a false statement, mistakenly made a false statement to the committee when he was testifying under oath saying that he was not up ever up for the director to replace James Comey as director of the FBI. It's now apparently true that he did know he was going in to discuss uh, the directorship with President Trump. And at the same time, he also knew he was up for the role of special prosecutor. He knew this because Rod Rosenstein told him and told him that Trump didn't know. So he walked in and essentially lied to the president or hid from the president that he might be the special prosecutor while he was discussing this, the job of replacing James Comey as head of the FBI. That's one thing. But the other thing is this. You know, John Durham at the DOJ is investigating how this collusion story 
how this Russian collusion spying on Trump campaign began. And this is what this all this Ukraine stuff is about. All the Ukraine stuff is meant to discredit not just Trump, but Bill Barr and anybody who dares to say that the Democrats used the power of the deep state to try and stop Donald Trump before he became president. And they did. They spied on him. And there's no question about it. And every time somebody calls, uses the word spy, we have to have a 15 day discussion about how evil it is to use the word spy. Obama spied on Trump. It seems really likely that that's what happened now. So the IG report is coming out. The inspector general report, Michael Horowitz's report has already been filed. They're going over it. It's coming out. This is one of the reasons this Ukraine story is up there. That's the only reason, really. It is meant to discredit Trump before the real story comes out. But also, John Durham's investigation has expanded. It's expanded to overseas. This is a guy with a, a sterling reputation. So yesterday, there was a startling conversation. I found it startling between Brett Baer, the last honest newsman on television, and Catherine Herridge, the Fox intelligence reporter. This is an excellent reporter, Catherine Herridge. And Bear never does this. During the news portion of his show, he never really asks for opinions uh, at all, except unless he's interviewing someone. And he says to her, you know this world, you know this intelligence world, you're an intelligence reporter. What does it mean that Durham is expanding his investigation into what we call Obamagate, Obama's spying on the Trump campaign? Listen to this exchange. Catherine, you've been following the Russia probe, the investigation really from the beginning. What are your thoughts on these developments we brought at the beginning of the show on the scope of the Durham investigation expanding? Brett, the expansion of the Durham investigation, this broader time frame from the spring of 2016 until Mueller's appointment in May of 2017, the fact that he's asking for additional resources, additional agents, the fact that it's now a global investigation. He's been to Italy, Britain. He's also working with the Australians. All of this, based on my experience from the very beginning, is that Durham has found evidence that likely points to criminal wrongdoing. And based on my two decades covering the Justice Department, he is not the type of prosecutor to ask for extra help if there is simply no there, there, Brett. That's a reporter with background information that she can't reveal that she thinks that this guy has now hit on a criminal actions in the Obama administration at the top level. This is obviously happening at the top level of the FBI and the CIA. If I were John Brennan, I would be wearing a big mustache and a clown nose so nobody recognized me. But I, I don't know who he's going after. But clearly, this is this is coming down the pike. And this is what all this Ukraine stuff is about. All the Ukraine stuff is smokescreen, totally smokescreen. I said this from the day it happened. I said it the day it broke. I said it on the backstage show. It is smokescreen about this. And what's really interesting about this, and Bear mentioned this later in the kind of panel discussion part of the program, a lot of the mainstream media isn't covering this at all. They're going to do everything they can to bury this. But that them days are over. The days of ABC, NBC, and CBS, and that's the news. That's the way it is, as Walter Cronkite used to say. Them days are over. This is going to come out. This is going to come out. And a lot of people who read the New York Times, if there are any honest people left reading the New York Times, are going to look up and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, huh? You know, it, it's it's bad. It's wait just a second. It's bad that Trump asked the Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden, a candidate. But it's not bad that Barack Obama spied through his intelligence agencies on candidate Donald Trump. How does that make any sense? How does that make any sense? And where were you guys, New York Times, Chuck Todd, Jake Tapper? Where were you guys when Obama was doing that? And why have you been covering it up all this time? That's what's coming down the pike. That's what the Ukraine story is about. And it's also about one other thing. The, the Democrat side of this coming, upcoming election sucks. I don't care what the press is telling you. I don't care what, any, what what the polls are saying. These guys are in deep, deep trouble, okay? Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren has been going around from place to place telling the story about how she was fired from a job as a teacher because she was pregnant. Uh, this is cut number 10 is where she makes this claim, and she's making this again and again. This is just one time. Teaching special needs kids is a calling, but... I finished the first year visibly pregnant, and back in those days, it meant you didn't get invited back. She was kicked out for being visibly pregnant. Now, here's the way she described the same thing in, two th in a 2008 interview. I did that for a year, and then that summer, uh, I, I actually didn't have the education courses, so I was on an emergency certificate, it was mm -hmm. called, and I went back 
to graduate school and took a couple of courses in education and said, I don't think this is going to work out for me. Mm. And I was pregnant with my first baby. So I had a baby uh, and stayed home for a couple of years. And I was really casting about, thinking, what am I going to do? Um, and uh, my husband's view of it was, stay home. Uh, you know, we have children, mm. we'll have more mm. children. Uh, you'll love this. And uh, I was very restless about it. So that's a total, that is a different story. And according to minutes from the Riverdale Board of Education, 1971, obtained by the Washington Free Beacon. And my question is, why is only the conservative Washington Free Beacon had the intellectual curiosity to look into this? I mean, if this were a Democrat candidate, what about NBC? What about ABC? What about the New York Times? Wouldn't they all have been on top of this? But no, it's just the Washington Free Beacon. Warren was unanimously offered her job back from the Board of Education. So here she is dodging the question, which she's finally asked. I don't know who asked it on the campaign tra trail, but listen to her non-responses. Is it accurate to say you were fired or were you forced to resign or how would we characterize this? You know, look, I, it doesn't matter much what the term is, but let's be clear. I was six months pregnant. Uh, it was my first job. I was 22 years old. And uh, the job that was mine that I'd been hired for for the next year was taken away when they knew I was pregnant. Just to be clear, because I want to make sure I have this down, mm -hmm. they were not incorrect, though, to say that you were fired. Yeah, I, I don't know what else you'd call it. I mean, it was my job. In, and in April, they'd said, you're doing a great job, come back next year. And when they found out I was pregnant, they changed that. So that's, that's going to be, that is a, provable or disprovable statement. It really sounds to me like she's lying. And the thing about it is, is that she, we know she lies. We know she had this story her whole career about being whatever she was, a Cherokee. I, I can't remember what tribe she was supposed to be part of, she, which she even tried to sell after a blood test showed that it wasn't true. She even tried to sell, well, I had one fifty billionth of a drop of uh, Native American blood in me. The, the thing is, that's a pattern of behavior, a pattern of portraying yourself as a left-wing victim in order to get ahead in your profession. That's a pattern of behavior. That is something she does, right? And she's doing it. If, that, if it's true that she was offered her job back and she just didn't take it because she wanted to stay home with her baby, good for her. If it's true, she's now spinning that to make herself look like a victim once again. We know that's something that she does. We know that's her whole career has been based on that. It raises questions about her leftism. It raises questions about the victim, the victim, victim crat uh, society, uh, victim crat culture of leftism. And it raises questions about her personal integrity. And I think that that's an important thing. She's now really the front runner. If she's not the front runner, she's tied with Joe Biden for the front runner. And meanwhile, Bernie Sanders. Look, I think the guy's finished. He had a heart attack and he comes out and now he says he's going to cut back on his campaign activities. Uh, I must confess that I was dumb. Uh, I was born and thank God that I have a lot of energy. Uh, and, you know, during this campaign, I've been doing in some cases three or four rallies a day running all over the state, Iowa, New Hampshire, wherever. And yet I, in the last month or two, uh, just was more fatigued than I usually have been. So, uh, and I should have listened to those symptoms. I should have listened to those symptoms. So if there's any message that I hope we can get out there is that I want people to pay attention to their symptoms. And you know, when you're hurting, when you're fatigued, when you have pain in your chest, listen to it. So that's about all. Let me, let me hear what the doctor has to say, okay? Thank well, thanks, Dad, for that advice. But look, look, I, I wish I wish him nothing but good health. Truly, I truly do. I want him out there making trouble and fighting. I hope the GOP uh, opposes him, beats him, defeats him. But I do not want him uh, in bad health. But the guy would be 80 when he took office. He's just had a heart attack. It's irresponsible for him to run to, for president. It would be irresponsible for him to have a child. You know, I mean, there's certain things you get to a certain age and you say, hey, you know, Times time, people die, people are mortal, mortality is real. There's things I, I can't do anymore because I just don't have the time. This is why you don't see me playing Major League Baseball. I'd be out there like a second trying out for the Yanks, but you know, I don't have time to get that skill back. It's, age does certain things to you. 
He's done. He's finished. He's not. No one is going to elect an 80 year old man who does, who's not in good health and they shouldn't elect him. They shouldn't do it. I, you know, again, God bless him, but they shouldn't. He shouldn't be running for president of the United States at this point. And Biden, as I predicted, I think this thing with the Ukraine, the smokescreen they're putting up against the investigation into Obamagate is destroying Biden. And I think that was part of their calculation. They must have thought, yeah, this may take Biden down, but what the hell, we've got, you know, Elizabeth Warren in our back pocket. Uh, listen to him now. I mean, he's not, this guy is not even defending himself. How is your role as vice president in, uh, in charge of policy in Ukraine and your son's job in Ukraine, how is that not a conflict of interest? It's not a conflict of interest. There's been no indication of any conflict of interest from but Ukraine even, or anywhere else. But even Period. I'm not going to I'm not going to respond to that. Let's focus on the problem. Focus on this man, what he's doing that no president has ever done. No president. <laughs> I mean, God, that's not a good candidate. This this stuff, you know, these guys have been so protected by the Chuck Todds of the world. They've been so protected by the Jake Tappers of the world that when they find themselves confronted with the reality of their situation, what would we, the people, actually see when some reporter shouts those questions? They fall apart. They can't deal with it. How are they going to deal with Donald Trump on a debate stage? They're not going to be able to. Fortunately for the Democrats, there is one candidate remaining who could come in like a white knight, like a white knight rushing to their defense. <laughs> do we have Do we have her? Yes, we do. Cut number seven. Here is Judy Woodruff. You can sit, tell Trump is afraid of this one candidate because he sent out this tweet that Judy Woodruff now confronts her with. He said, I think that crooked Hillary Clinton should try to enter the race to try and steal it away from uber left Elizabeth Warren. Only one condition, the crooked one must explain all of her high crimes and misdemeanors, including how and why. She deleted 33,000 emails. Yeah, you know, it, it truly is remarkable how obsessed he remains with me. Uh, but this latest tweet is, um, you know, so uh, typical of him. Uh, nothing has been more examined and looked at than my emails. We all know that. So he's either lying or delusional or both. There was no subpoena, as he uh, says in a tweet this morning. Um, so maybe there does need to be a rematch. I mean, obviously, I can beat him again. I can beat him again like I beat him the last time. That's why I'm president of the United States today. Only the evil wizard who cast a veil of delusion across America makes it seem that I'm not the president of the United States. But if I have to run against him, Madame Chardonnay, I love her. You know, if I had a staff of like 100 people, I could. it would be easy easy for me to go and find videos of all her scandals of her saying, oh, that's already been investigated. Nothing's been investigated more. That is always, always, this is old news. It's always how she handles her own corruption. It's old news. I love politics. I just love this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. Hillary Clinton is going to get into it again because she won last time. She can win again. Absolutely. Folks, the Daily Wire's long-awaited app is finally here, and it's fantastic. I've been playing around with it. It is great. If you're a subscriber, you can access all our content, including articles, shows, and more straight from the app. All access subscribers, that's another level of subscription, get our new and exclusive discussion features where they can interact directly with our hosts, writers, and other special guests. The app is available on Apple and Android. Download it today, become a subscriber, and come join the fun. You can also be in the mailbag, which is uncomfortable, but you get to ask questions. So it's a good deal to subscribe. Come on over to dailywire.com for the mailbag. Mailbag. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. I, we want, I want one for another kingdom, too. You know, when I talk about another kingdom, I want somebody screaming with delight as well. Uh, from Colin. Hey, wise sage, I need some advice. I've been a liberal basically my whole thinking life, but now I'm turning right. So he's been red pilled. And this has caused my wife to question whether or not we even hold the same values anymore. A lot of contention. We argue. I try to find common ground, but more often than not, I just try to avoid the confrontation. Uh, we have other problems, but I'm interested specifically on your take on how to navigate this without fighting about politics and religion and without biting my tongue all the time. Uh, 
By the way, I'm also a non-denominational God believer. We have two boys, five and seven, and I'm also frustrated at the pushback I get from my wife when I talk to them about religion, spirituality, and the Bible. I expect your answer to be 100% correct and to solve this problem completely with little or no work on my end. <laughs> that's, very, that's good. Uh, perhaps the government could solve it for me. Uh, and he says, go easy on Knowles. He's my favorite. So I think you haven't quite developed in your conservative thinking if Knowles uh, is your favorite. But you, you work on that. You'll get, you'll get there. Um, so... As Joe Biden said, uh, ask the right question. The problem with this email is when you say we have other problems, but I'm interested specifically on your take on how to navigate this without fighting about politics and religion. It's, it's, the, it's the problem in the marriage. It's not the problem with your politics and religion. It is, look, if you're married over a long period of time, and you obviously have been, if you have a 10-year-old, if you're married over a long people, period of time, people are going to change. People are going to change. My wife married a secular Jewish liberal. She's now married to a Christian conservative. That you know, th these are things people are going to go through changes. There has to be that can cause tension, but there also has to be flexibility to allow for growth. You can't let your marriage be a stagnant pond where you both just sit there the same forever. People are going to change, and that's a good thing if they change in the right ways. The problem is that you have not got the lines of communication open where you can talk about these things as you're talking about them to me. In other words, the fact that you're writing to me instead of sitting down with her in a friendly and loving way and saying, you know, I've gone through a change and it's causing some tension about it. How do we deal with this? I'm not, I don't want to hide from you. I don't want to turn off the TV when you walk into the room. I don't want to live like I'm in enemy territory. I want to be able to share my religion with my children, but also leave room for you to share your uh, opposition to religion with your children. They have to know that they have parents who disagree and that that's okay. How do we get to that place? If you can't have that conversation with your wife, that's the problem. It's, if you can't have the meta conversation about this problem, that's the problem. So if you can't, you got to go get some uh, help, some counseling, find out how to have that conversation. Make sure you get a counselor who's sympathetic to both your points of view and isn't just treating you like you're the, some kind of patient because you have uh, conservative views. But that's the problem you have. The problem is in your marriage and in your communication, not with some device or trick you can use that is going to, what you make a joke about. You say you want an answer that's going to have little or no work on your end no can do. You know, I mean, it, you have got to work on this aspect of your marriage. You have got to be able to sit down with her and say, hey, here's the problem. Isn't that, you know, look, in every marriage, like in every marriage, you have these little things that come up and are problems. The two of you have to be on the side of the marriage. You can't be on your side or her side. You have to be on the side of the marriage. So you sit down and you say, hey, the marriage has a problem. How do we fix the marriage? If you can't do that, get help doing it because that's the way uh, you have to go forward. And you have two young kids, so you got to keep that marriage together. Uh, from Kyle, I've been a Christian my whole life. Uh, and I have a question. I was studying theology in our textbook, Christian Doctrine, by Shirley Guthrie, claims that the fact that Jesus was male was ultimately meaningless and deserves little analysis. Uh, Guthrie claims we ought to not to make too much of Jesus' masculinity and the significance of the fact that Jesus was male is only that he was a flesh and blood human being, nothing more than that. My thoughts are if it's important that a biblical woman does something like Mary Magdalene and the other Mary witnessing the resurrection first, why is Jesus' maleness not insignificant? Of course, of course, that is a political delusion. Uh, in my mind, the writer can't have it both ways. Um, yes, this is a thing that I hear a lot in church and it is an attempt to accommodate political feminist feelings, and it is bad theology, in my opinion. Let me warn you once again that I am not a theologian. I am simply giving you my reading and my version of the religion. Uh, God is above gender. God, you know, our categories don't mean diddly to God, you know, I mean, like, if you're, you know, but, but that's, it's just out of our pay grade. But we know that God is above gender because the Bible says, he created man in his image, male and female. So we know that he is above the category of gender and both men and women are in his image, but they are different versions of that image. Obviously, men and women are not the same. So the question, it seems to me, is why, why do we experience God as male? Why do we experience God as father and son? Now, maybe the Holy Spirit, a lot of people like to say, well, the Holy Spirit is kind of a feminine uh, aspect of that, but I don't actually even agree with that. I think we experience God as Father, and we experience Jesus as the Father's Son. And that is, of course, it's significant. Everything is significant, and erasing it is just a political accommodation. 
There are lots of reasons I think we experience God as a father. One, of course, is that he stands outside of creation as a father does with his children, right? The, the child develops inside the mother, but is always outside the father. And we are always, creation is separate from God. It's something he did. He spoke it into being. It is not that we are inside uh, God like a, like a child inside a mother. We are something he made like a father makes something. It's also because God uh, deals out it, God is absolute reality. He is absolute reality, more like a father than like a mother, a mother who kind of encourages you, who's in your feelings, who says you're wonderful, you're perfect. That God says, you know, it, God is like the uh, the father in the prodigal son story. All right, you know, you want to go out and spend all your money? Here's your money. Go do it. I'm not going to stop you from being free. And then when you're sitting there, you know, eating trash because you're starving to death and you come back and say, uh, take me back. God will welcome you back, but he's not going to stop you from destroying yourself. So God is very like a father. And I think we do experience him that way. And we experience this male relationship. But there's something else. You know, in, in Paradise Lost, one of the greatest poems uh, in the English language, John Milton describes Adam and Eve. And he has a very, very controversial line in the poem where he says, he for God, Adam for God, and she for God in him. And of course, that is like enough to make any feminist's head explode, but fem exploding feminist heads is a kind of form of entertainment for me. I think it's like a video game. Uh, so, so he for God and she for God in him. And that actually represents something real about women and men, which is that men deal with objects. They deal with life through the outer world and women deal in relationships primarily. Obviously, there are different people. There are individuals. I'm not making a vast generalization. I'm making a generalization, and generalizations always have exceptions. But that actually says something about the way men and women relate to the world. If you look at the art that women like, it's about feelings, it's about relationships, it's about love. If you look at the art that men like, it tends to be informational. They tend to not be as interested in fiction. They tend to be more interested in nonfiction, history. Uh, even when you read male-oriented fiction, it's filled with things like, how do you build a tank. You know, I mean, I, personally, I, I can't stand that stuff. I'm reading a story. I want to get to the story. But in, in fiction directed toward males, it's always like, here's how you build a tank. Here's how you find a good wine. Here's how you pick a good car. They love information. They deal with the world outside. That indicates that they're going to find their happiness in different places. Men are going to find their happiness doing things. Women are going to find their happiness in relationships. Now, I sit here all the time and I tell women, you know what, you're going to be a lot happier if you have a family, if you put your family first, if you put your children first, and if you let your husband do the thing that comes naturally to him, which is supporting you and making a career for himself. That's where he's going to get his gratification. You're going to get your gratification elsewhere. Women get angry at me for this as if I'm telling them what to do. I don't give a rat's what you do. I seriously do not care what you do. Live your life. Find out who you are. All I think you should do, I recommend that you do, is question the people who are telling you what to do. Because the feminists are telling you what life you should live. The feminists are telling you what to put it ahead. I'm telling you what I think, what I think will make you happier. But I know you're an individual. Maybe you have a different path. I don't care. I seriously don't care. So I think that the, the, the fact that God, we experience God as male, tells us something about our nature. The idea that men experience God directly and women experience God through love of human beings and men, uh, I think is a, an insight that Milton had that is out of fashion and yet true. And I think uh, things that are out of fashion and yet true will be rediscovered. The truth can be uh, thrown out the door, but it always climbs back in through the window. And I think this is something that women should look at. Women, I think, are getting more and more unhappy, lonelier, uh, more detached from themselves. And I think that the, the, the people who speak, the people who have a, a, the greatest voice, especially women who have the greatest voice, are women who didn't stay home, didn't have that life. And so they're basically making excuses for themselves to you. So, so I'm, I think that this is it's important that God's nature appears to us as male. I think it's a lie to tell us that it doesn't. And I think that that's something that people should look at. But that's just me. And you don't have to listen to me. From Jesse, uh, Mr. K-L-A-V-A-N. Uh, if I may gush for just a moment before asking my question, this is kind of in the same topic. She says, you have helped me so much in making the decision to stop working my full-time job in order to raise our children. My husband and I will start trying next month. Your words about and reverence for stay-at-home moms truly strengthens me. Thank you. That's, that's very nice to hear. And again, I don't, I don't care what you do. I'm just telling you what I think. Uh, 
But this brings me to my question. I've recently completed my first novel. I know everyone says this, but I think it's really something special. Uh, the trouble is this is my first novel. I live in the middle of the country, so agent interest is very low. Do you have any advice about how to make my query stand out to literary agents or about how to find the right agent? Do you think it's even possible to find an agent, pursue a literary career, given my situation? I want to do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it's possible uh, to find an agent. I personally think, look, I never made connections. I can't I can't be friendly with people I don't like. So I never met, went out and made connections that would just help me to be uh, to help my career. But the literary world is still a world. Connections always matter. Connections always help you. But the literary world is still a world where they need material. Your material is more important than you. I mean, it does help these days, I know, to have a Twitter following, and they say they can promote things better. But there are still editors who want to see a great piece of fiction and want it to go forward. There's plenty of books. I mean, I always recommend Writer's Market. I haven't looked at it in a few years, but Writer's Market used to be the kind of industry standard, which will explain to you how to approach an agent, how to write a query letter that they'll read, how many pages to send in, which agents to pick. All that stuff is available. It's all available, and you shouldn't be discouraged at all. It, it can be hard. It can take a long time. It does help to have a contact, but a lot of times people with contacts make mistakes. Like they'll go to the publisher without an agent and then they get turned down and they've lost that submission place where the agent might have said, no, I know a better um, a better editor there than your contact who will like this more than your contact would like it. So I, I find agents very helpful. There's also self-publishing is now available. This is stuff that's open to you and available to you and you should take advantage of it. There's nothing at all uh, to keep you from from pursuing this. If your novel is special, look, you could be wrong. People always think their novels are special. You're right, but you could be right too. And, uh, and if you're right, I think you can, I think you can sell it. It's a very tough business and it's in, it's in decline because people aren't reading as much and fiction is the fiction market is in decline. So it's a tough road to hoe, but there's absolutely no reason for you not to go forward. And, uh, God bless you with your kids. Uh, one more. I'll go a little late. David, I believe from David, I believe very firmly that the best thing parents can do for their children is stick together provide a warm and loving home. However, uh, my wife does not agree with me. My soon-to-be ex-wife would rather have the freedom to go to bars and party. She's dead set on divorce. I'm certainly no saint, but I was quite surprised to re receive the divorce papers. I've recently rediscovered Christ after turning from him, after returning from the Iraq war. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. My question to you is this, what is the best thing I can do for my two sons as a single father? Well, uh, gee, that the answer it's a long answer uh, that I can't give you, but first of all, thank you for your service, and I'm really glad you're uh, getting past the alcoholism or recovering from alcoholism. You got obviously, if you're going to be a single father, you have got to toe that line. You have got to stay sober. You have got to stay sober, and you've got to cling to the hem of Christ's garment and make sure you stay sober. The one thing I would tell you is it sounds like you're angry, and I don't blame you for being angry. We all get angry when people do things like this. I'm not sure whether you have custody of the child or whether she does, but the, it's very, very important that you set your anger aside and have a relationship with these children's mother. Uh, you know, if, if she's dangerous, if she shouldn't drive with them in the car, <clears throat> if she drinks too much, if she's doing stuff that's dangerous, then you got to protect them from her. But do not, if you can help it in any way, bring your fight to their, their lives. It is better for them if you can get along with their mom. And if you can get along with her and she can't get along with, with you, they will see that and that they'll understand that. But you have got to be the guy. If you're going to be dad, if you are going to be dad, you've got to be dad. You've got to be there. You've got to be on top of it. You've got to put them first, their welfare first, their welfare above the next drink. You've got to put their welfare again, above your anger. You've got to put their welfare above any place you want to go that's going to be damaging to them. And you've got to be there for them 100%. And part of that is keeping a good Good relationship with their mom, if you can, if it if it's at all possible, you got to do it. Other things I could tell you, but you know the drill, man. You got to love the kids. You got to bring them up. You got to be there. Being, they got to be able to smell you, pal. They got to be able to smell you. If the kids can't smell you, you ain't there. So uh, stick it out. Really, uh, God bless you in beating the in the booze. It's a devil. It will take your soul. I'm glad you're out of it. Stay out of it. I got to stop there. I'm Andrew Claven. We'll be back again tomorrow with the Andrew Claven Show. Oh, hooray, hoorah. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Austin Stevens and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. And our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. 
edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. As Democrats threaten to remove President Trump from office, the White House strikes a defiant tone and tells Democrats exactly where they can put their impeachment inquiry. We examine the president's strategy. Then, Mitt Romney continues to be Mitt Romney. AOC wants to abolish prisons. And Justin Trudeau explains blackface to a cute little girl. All that and more, check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.